We shall commence this module by discussing about the theory of unlimited supply of labor in brief. The theory of unlimited supply of labor 1954 by Sir William Arthur Lewis is a greatly acclaimed, widely commented and extensively quoted theory that provides a theoretical description of how an egregarian society gets transformed in a developed and industrialized economy. This theory is also known as dual sector model or popularly as Lewis model. The dual economy model originally developed by W. Arthur Lewis 1954 and later by John Fay and Gustav Ranus in 1964. In the theory, there are two sectors, the traditional or the household or the subsistence sector which is situated in the rural areas and is confined to the cultivation of crops for domestic consumption requirements and the capitalist or the urban or modern urban industrialized sector whose economic activities are mainly mines, plantation and manufacturing which are carried out purely for profit motive. The traditional sector is that part of the economy which either does not employ or employs a negligible amount of reproducible means of production that is physical capital stock. On the other hand, the capitalist sector makes use of reproducible means of production and it pays the capitalist for the use thereof. The capitalist hires the services of labor to produce reproducible means of production and thus it controls the use of capital. The traditional sector consists of labor force LF which is illiterate, backward and unskilled and naive. Productivity of this labor force is low and marginal productivity of labor is considered to be zero, close to zero and even negative at times. Whereas in the capitalist sector labor force is literate, sophisticated and even looks skilled. Hence, the two sectors seem completely contrasting to each other as per the theory. After studying this module, you shall be able to understand the Lewis model of economic development or the model of unlimited supply of labor. Understand the concept of disguised unemployment. Learn the interrelationship between rural subsistence sector and urban advanced sector and drawbacks of Lewis model of economic development. Now, let us discuss the features of Lewis model. The Lewis model is formulated on the basis of certain assumptions which are as under 1. Prevalence of unlimited supply of labor at the subsistence wage rate in the traditional sector that is a perfectly elastic supply curve of labor which is horizontal to x-axis at the subsistence wage rate. Second, capital and other natural resources are assumed to be highly scarce in relation to the predominance of labor force. Hence, the former are assumed to be the real bottleneck to the economic expansion. Third, economy is dualistic in nature that is there is existence of two kinds of social systems in the economy. Fourth, skill formation is only a quasi bottleneck that is it is a temporary phenomena that can be outweighed by incurring some cost of imparting skills. Fifth, there is a dubious assumption which Lewis could not answer why. He assumed that wages in the expanding capitalist sector are determined by the wage earnings in the subsistence sector that is WK is a function of WS and WK are 30% greater than WS where WK stands for wages earned in the capitalist sector and WS stands for wages earned in the traditional sector. Sixth, Lewis assumed that profits are the only source of capital accumulation which means the entire amount of wage money is consumed. In other words, the propensity to consume of workers is one and that of the capitalists is 
0, whereas the propensity to save is 1. Seventh, there is no distinction between technical know-how and the growth of productive capital. Technical progress leads to higher growth in the form of increasing profits which leads to increase in employment and investment. Lewis starts his model by identifying the central problem in the theory of economic development. He said capital accumulation is the central problem confronting every underdeveloped economy. That is how to transform an economy which is saving and investing only 3 to 4 percent of its national income into an economy which saves and invests 12 to 15 percent of its national income. This is because increase in savings if channelized into productive investment can bring about multiplier times increase in national income which in turn would lead to economic development. Now let us discuss the identification of prevalence of disguised unemployment or underemployment. Looking at the diagram, MPN represents the demand curve for labor in the traditional sector or the marginal productivity curve for labor which initially increases with an increase in the quantity of labor then falls and ultimately becomes negative with further increase in the supply of labor force. OZ represents the supply curve of labor in the traditional sector which includes farmers, petty traders, retainers, domestic and commercial and women in the household. The intersection of demand for and supply of labor determines the equilibrium at point B highlighting that only ON quantity of labor force is productively employed out of OZ and NZ is that part of the labor force which is not gainfully employed. Part of the latter labor force is disguisedly underemployed that is NT and partly unemployed that is TZ. Disguisedly underemployed labor force signifies that section of labor force whose marginal productivity is though positive but less than the subsistence wage rate whereas the section of labor force whose marginal productivity is zero or maybe negative forms the part of the disguised unemployed labor force. So the argument by Lewis is that if NZ amount of labor force is removed from the traditional sector its output will stay intact and this labor force could be used for capital accumulation in the capitalist sector. Next, we shall understand what determines subsistence wage rate WS in the traditional sector. According to Lewis, WS depends upon the minimum earning requirements for survival. Wage rate needs differ with respect to interpersonal levels but the basic needs required for survival are more or less the same. Similarly, for all workers, WS is the same. Nevertheless, WS cannot be less than the average productivity of labor except in two cases. First, when the labor force has to pay higher rents and second, when food prices are increasing. Wage rate in the capitalist sector is higher than that of the traditional sector. Although Lewis could not explain why WK is exactly 30% higher than WS but he did argue that people working in the rural areas will not leave their traditional occupation unless the expected wage rate from the capitalist sector is more than WS. He elucidated the same with the help of four plausible explanations which are as under one. When the total output or the average productivity per labor is increasing in the traditional sector, the workers who intend to move out of the traditional sector would do so if higher wages are offered in the capitalist sector. Two, even when the total output in the traditional sector remains intact but the withdrawal of labor force 
from the said sector leaves behind a fewer number of clements to that output again ws would increase and hence wk has to be higher so as to encourage people to join the capitalist sector 3 government tacit wage determination policy now there can be such policies of government that adjust the workers wages through way of dns allowance whenever there is a price rise so that the real wages remains same hence in the incidence of such policies, the wage rate remains higher and the capitalist wage rate is still higher. Fourth, humanitarian considerations. Lewis explained that the capitalists are human beings. They ensure that the workers working with them do not die of starvation and hunger. So, they give them higher wages on humanitarian grounds. However, it is only a theoretical point because the basic feature of capitalism is immiserization of workers. Now, we shall move on to the working of the Lewis model. Lewis model for closed economy. The initial employment in the capitalist sector at WK wage rate is ON0, established by the intersection of supply of labor curves and the demand for labor curve MPN corresponding to which the total wage bill is OWKE0N0 and the total output produced in the capitalist sector is ONE0N0. Thus, in the present scenario, the capitalist earns a profit or surplus equivalent to NKWE0. Now, when the capitalist is earning profits, he'll reinvest the income in the business with the desire to earn more profit. This will lead to an increase in the employment from ON0 to ON1 with the shift in the demand for labor curve towards the right. This increase in employment accrues to migration of labor from traditional to capitalist sector for the purpose of larger income. Furthermore, with the rise in employment in the capitalist sector, its output and profit will also rise. So again, the capitalist will be tempted and reinvests the profits in the business leading to a rightward shift in the demand for labor curve, increase in employment and hence increase in surplus. Therefore, the focal point in the Lewis model is that in order to increase the output, the capitalist profit should grow. That is, profit is a very important source of capital accumulation. Hence, the factors determining the process of economic development in the Lewis model are A. Accrual and recycling of profits by the capitalists and B. Share of capitalist sector in national income and share of capitalist profit in national income. Although accrual of profits by the capitalist is an important source of capital accumulation, it is not the only source. According to Lewis, the provision of bank credit plays the same role as profits. But the expansion of bank credit generates inflationary pressures in the economy, which, as per Lewis, are a temporary phenomena which lasts only till the project fructifies. When inflation disappears, real income of people would increase and the government can collect larger taxes which can increase government's revenue and that would increase savings which would further reduce inflation. The process of capital accumulation as demonstrated by Lewis may seem to be an endless process due to the capitalists greed to earn more and more. But Lewis gave few cases under which it will come to an end. These cases are as under. First, when as a result of the ongoing process of development of the capitalist sector, no surplus labor force is left behind in the subsistence sector. It is the non-availability of surplus labor force which acts as a drag on the process of economic development. Second, when capital formation is so rapid that it catches up 
or is more than the excess supply of labor force then a stage may be reached where the real wage rate is no longer constant if the wage rate rises profits of the capitalist will decline third when the capitalist sector is growing faster than the traditional sector then the terms of trade may turn against the capitalist sector as the demand for goods of traditional sector rises the cost of production will also rise and terms of trade will turn against the capitalist sector thus it will be very difficult to expand the capitalist sector fourth if the traditional sector adopts new methods of production its output would rise and hence wages in the traditional sector would rise this would lead to a rise in the wages of the capitalist sector which would further lead to a fall in the profits of the latter sector fifth if the workers in the capitalist sector start imitating the capitalist's way of life they will find it difficult to sustain at the present wages they would then seek for higher wages which would increase the total wage bill resulting in a fall in the capitalist profits and thus halting the process of development now we move on to discuss the lewis model for an open economy one salient feature that underlies the lewis model in an open economy is that so long as capital accumulation is taking place the capitalist sector will continue to expand subject to certain factors if however the process of capital accumulation is constrained then the lewis model has limited significance and capital accumulation in the open economy is possible through two ways only either by one by immigration of abundant labor or by second which is outsourcing of capital however capital accumulated by these two ways can have severe consequences like resentment of native labor force towards migrating labor force because in the absence of migration the former use to get higher wages therefore the possibility of immigration of abundant labor force from less developed economies to more developed economies is limited second way that is to export capital to areas which are labor abundant is also limited according to lewis as it can lead to balance of payment difficulties now we move on to understand the difficulties in the application of lewis model first this model is a one sided theory it overlooks the possibility of development of the primary sector per se which can be made available for the capitalist sector this theory leads to a lopsided pattern of development according to which the share of capitalist sector continuously increase and that of the traditional sector falls this is contrary to the theory of structural transformation which notifies that the revolution of agriculture sector paves way for part of development of the non agricultural sector the labor transfer model however failed to generate adequate employment and the key assumptions of his theory did not fit in well with the realities or empirical foundation of agrarian economies experiences show that the labor absorption capacity in the industrial sector has been quite limited owing to the higher capital intensity and fast industrial restructuring that tend to displace existing labor with capital second it is argued that lewis built this model around the primary assumption that there is prevalence of unlimited supply of labor which in itself is a questionable for example west, uh, west african countries are thinly populated yet underdeveloped third the lewis model's assumption that economic factor of higher wages would induce everyone from the traditional sector to move to the modern sector is widely criticized as there exists other social 
and personal ties in the traditional sector, which are very strong and difficult to break. Hence, mobility of labor is a universal phenomena. Fourth, this theory wrongly assumes that productivity of labor is negative in the traditional sector. Some economists like Peter G. Schultz ruled out the possibility of disguised underemployment and unemployment in the traditional sector. The wage constancy assumption in the industrial sector even for underemployed rural laborers seemed to be quite unreasonable and untenable and does not borne out by the facts. Fifth, there is a doubtful assumption that it is only the class of profiteers who generate savings that is workers don't save and hence do not account for capital accumulation. For example, in Japan, workers small savings had been quite notable. Sixth, in the model, inflation is treated as temporary bottleneck. However, critics pointed out that if inflationary pressures build up, then it would jeopardize the growth process and causes havocs in the underdeveloped countries. Seventh, it is said that skill formation is also treated as a quasi bottleneck. However, critics pointed out that it is a serious bottleneck. Eighth, the theory neglects administration tax for economic development and many underdeveloped countries like India are highly corrupt. The reinvestment of profit in the capitalist sector can be such that capitalist earns additional profit but employment generation doesn't take place. Such kind of movement from rural to urban sector would lead to an increase in the urban informal sector and we term the whole process of growth as the process of jobless growth. Lewis himself realized the limitations of his theory when he revisited and observed the following major constraints such as large size of traditional sector, pervasiveness of labor saving innovations and vulnerability of small scale enterprises in 1979. Let us now summarize what we have discussed in this module. First, Lewis model of dualistic economic development therefore provides a suitable theoretical framework for studying the growth path of labor surplus developing economies like Asian economies. Second, it identifies the problem of disguised unemployment and underemployment in the traditional sector. Third, it suggests how an agrarian economy could be transformed into an industrialized economy and fourth it is a one-sided theory that propagates the development of one sector at the expense of the other.